We're at the Atomic Testing Museum, and it's October 24th, 2015. We were on maneuvers in Texas, and we were on our way back, and our commander got evidently got the word they needed service, teletype service from the town from Las Vegas test site in, into Las Vegas and we had teletype in our trucks, radio teletype. We had the radio and teletype combination and we were detailed, detail, detailed to come here to provide communications for the test site, test, and so my organization, my portion of the organization, not the whole organization, part of the organization I was in, came here and we parked just east of Highway 95, just off of 95. And we set up for AP and UP and INS, Associated Press, International Press, and United Press, newspaper services, reporters could stay there and make their reports from there to us, and we could take the reports from them to the clerk, and the clerk could type it up on, on the teletype, and they could send it to the, to the stations in Vegas. And when it arrived at the station in Vegas, it went from there all over the world. It went to Moscow, Tokyo, Philippines, all over the world. Otherwise, the world would not know what happened here in Camp Desert Rock. It would never know the whole world because it would be just up, boom, and you feel the concussion and it's all over. And the troops are out here, we know about it only through the newspapers, and we provided the services. Did I had all the papers in a box. I gave it to my, I was single at the time, 23 years old, six years in the Army, and I gave the papers to my mother, my parents in Long Beach, California, and my sister got married to a Navy man that she was dating in Long Beach. You know how Long Beach, the Navy's come to shore? Of the ships, they do, they and my, them. <laughs> my sister was of that age, and she dated him and married him, and she got married and rent a storage place and put those papers in the storage, and guess what? She did not pay the storage fee, and what happened? They took a I saw it, and they cut the lock, and away went the papers. It would be worth a lot of money right now, but the papers are all gone. And I was 23 years old. Maybe I'd be a millionaire. Who knows? Did you witness any explosions? Huh? Did you witness any explosions? No. Did you just feel the concussion? I never, never said anything to her. What, what, what am I going to get out of it? You're gone. He has told me how he saw the atomic bomb go off. So talk I about saw, that. I saw it from, from Highway 95, which is approximately 10 miles. I think they said it was 10 miles. And we saw the mushroom. I saw the airplane go over. And then all of a sudden, that's it. I'd go up, and all of a sudden I hear <gasps> concussion. And our 
teletype operators are sitting on the keyboard just punching this all out. It was in the box. I took it and gave it to my, to my mother. I'm sick of 23 years old. I've already got, I've already got five years overseas in Europe. What, what did the explosions look like? Huh? What did the explosions look like? Well, just a fireball, just a fireball. Fire went up. And my, now my next door neighbor that I have, he lived in Azusa, California, which is approximately 200 miles from here. And he was 10 years old. And he said he saw the mushroom 200 miles, and he lives almost straight west in the same direction I was from when he was 200 miles, and I was 10. No, he was 10. Huh? No, he, he, he was, was 10. 10 years old. No, I was, he was 23. Oh, right. But he was 10 miles from the... Yeah. I was 10 miles away from him, yeah. and he was 10 years old. And he said, I told him about it I went to visit him. I was asking him about her back, scratching her, that she, she come, come up with. I had it in my hand and I showed it to him. And we come to talking about, he was in the Air Force. And he was at Running Man in Germany. He was telling about that. And, uh, How long did you work at the test site? We were only there about three days. Three days up and set up. We set up before the thing, you know, dare, dare two before, because we just out of things and set up and, you know, we're in maneuver situation. You know what maneuvers are? Maybe explain what maneuvers are, Wally. Maneuvers is when, when you're just able, you set up and you live in pup tents. Live in pup tents. Mm -hmm. You don't live in nothing that you can't pick up and go. You can put it in your duffel bag and go. How many? And you always know where it's at. How many times did you go out to the test site? I didn't never went there. We we never went anywhere. We just was right there. We were there to provide communications. That's it. Just the, the ten miles away. Ten miles away, and we went back on ninety five and headed down. So on the, on, just on the back, one time. On back. Well, there's only one bomb. <laughs> they don't repeat them too and, often. One bomb and we went back in 95 and went south and headed up southeast to San Luis Obispo, California. That's it. Okay, anything else you want and to add? We, we did provide the communication. Uh huh. And why not, since I have the, the recording now, I'll give your name again. My name is Wallace. James Lyons. L -Y. Yeah, I'm a senior now, but my junior is dead. L Y O N S. L Y O N S. And what? Are, when did you go into the service? January 1946. And when did you and leave? I retired in 1967. Fifty years ago. Yeah. Wow. I'm still. I'm still cooking. Yeah. Are there other things that you did while you were in the service that you would oh, like to share? Sure. I went. I went out of out, out of basic training. I was assigned. I didn't go to no. I never went to no schools for anything. OJT. Everything was OJT. And I went to Germany. Mm -hmm. I went to Frankfurt, New Jersey, New Jersey. Got on a troop ship, everything was troop ship surface. Then got on a troop ship and we went to Germany and I spent three years over there. And then I I didn't I was on no leave. So I come back, I had ninety days leave. Come so I went to North Havana, North Dakota, and I spent ninety days on leave over there. And I sent by 1875 bonds home every month, two of them every month, out of about fifty dollars that I got paid when I started. And we got 
We went up to seventy-five dollars out after after basic training. We went up fifty percent pay raise. What What about the uh, jeep that you bought? Oh, I bought a jeep over there, a surplus jeep for the motor sergeant because I didn't drink and I didn't crowds. I, I figured you didn't because you were sending back most of the money. <laughs> How and, many and I was and I was living on thirty seven dollars and fifty cents. You deduct thirty seven fifty from from fifty seventy five and how much you got left? Yeah, not much. Thirty seven fifty. That's what I had every month mm -hmm. for them three years. How many people on the base had a vehicle? Two. What's two. that? Two. Two of us had a Jeep. Nineteen forty two Jeep. Oh, Sur okay. Surplus Jeep. We're still paying it up on our drive. And who was your girlfriend for five years when you were in Frankfurt? Uh, my girlfriend was, was you, you heard of the name T H Y S S E N. Have you ever heard that name? Seen it? Printed? Have you ever been on an elevator and seen that name? No, I don't think so. You've been on one that said O T I S? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, sooner or later you see one T H Y S S E N. Okay. And that was one of the biggest providers of Hitler's money for during the Second World War. He f started financing Hitler in 1932, hmm. and he's with his daughter for five years. He was my he was my father-in-law. And we got married, and we lasted for, let me see how many, times five, times ten, nine, times ten, in about ninety days, it lasted. And one of the sailors from Long Beach, she, she went with my, my sister, she was about the same age, and she went with him, and he was from Kellogg. Idaho, and you know, from Idaho you have gold and silver and all that stuff, uh -huh. and, and you don't live there. You, you tell people what you have, how much you're worth, you know. And I grew up in North Dakota, and we had a pot, not much more than that. My dad was an alcoholic. And he did provide much more than that. That's why I went to the Army. Because I'm going to do it for myself. Mm -hmm. 17 and a half, I went to the Army. And I'm going to stay there and retire. And he did. And I did. And nobody's going to change my mind. So she thought that he was very wealthy because he was wealthy one because, two because I had a Jeep. had a vehicle. And I paid her way over. And we got married in 90 days. And I got a letter from her. She says, I'm going to Idaho. Of course, her, her, husband, her father was in Brazil or something. I've, I've, already, I've already figured out what happened. And I haven't heard nothing since. I'm going to Idaho. I said, well, wow. I'm going to Idaho. Wally, what happened when you were in France? We were in France in 1958. And De Gaulle got peeled. Remember, De Gaulle got peeled. No. He, and he said, "Get out! I don't want no people, no foreign troops in my country." He was still alive. Mm -hmm. And we left. It was about time for me to leave anyway. <laughs> Rotate. I worked in a teletype. Relay station, twelve hours a day, six days a week, because Vietnam was going, and all the, all the help was that was in Vietnam. What and happened in Korea? In Korea, I was in Korean military advisory group, and that was get the Korean military going, you know, training the military. In 1951-52, to get them started, mm -hmm. get their army going. The officers were training the 
training them. And I was a, a sergeant, and my job was to keep keep our detachment in, in line, you know, keep us going. So we keep the camp going and the officer did it. And every Sunday I get a jeep from the motor pool and I go down to Kunsan Air Base. This is during, the, during combat now. And I went there and watched the airplanes, the F 80s, 80s, taking off, going to North Korea. And then they come back. And another one take off. And they come back, and another one take off and go drop the bombs. I didn't have nothing to do with this. Just like sits I think. I was driving a Jeep, mm -hmm. keep it all day long. I come back, sign the troop ticket, get my age. Get back to Wonderful. What happened at the Presidio? I lived at the Presidio in the same place where Gorbachev lives there now. Right? He lives in San Francisco. Almost in the same place that I did. And I was rent free over there too. You know, army, you move in, where's your quarters, right? Okay. You don't pay rent. You don't pay utilities. And I was living in the same place. All, if you go there right now, they all look alike. Officers live there too. I wasn't an officer. I was 85. I had three kids and a wife. When you were in Germany, did you have anything to do with the Berlin air, airlift or anything? No, we were signal messenger service when I first went over there. And we worked out of the building where, well, when I first went to, to Frankfurt, I went to Frankfurt first. And uh, I beat Eisen, Eisenhower said this building we worked out of, we, we had an office in it. In the basement, but that was a building that Eisenhower said, well, this is going to be my headquarters building. Do not flatten in this building. The Ivy Farm. But the rest of Frankfurt was that high. Mm -hmm. All the buildings, you could walk down the street and see across town. That's a huge 40, building. 46, everything was flat. Bayer Aspirin, IB Farman. <gasps> I.B. Farben, Bear yeah, Aspen. That was I.G. Farben building, I.G. Farben building. Mm -hmm. That's what it was, the name of the building, I.G. Farben. And we were, we had for signal messenger service out of there. From there I drove a truck, worked one hour a day, had a two and a half ton truck, and I backed the truck in, in, down in, and we loaded the thing out and I took it to the train station and the couriers took the stuff out and they went to Berlin, they went to Darmstadt, they went to Heidelberg, Nuremberg, all over. And I sorted stuff on the inside. It was distribution is what it was. It wasn't mail. Mm -hmm. It wasn't post, post, post office mail. They brought the post office. But a distribution, you know. That's the way they handled it then. 46, 47, 48. Everything changed now. Teletype, they don't have teletype no more. That's gone. Now you, now you run on radio, radio. Computer. And now you, now you use adult toys, like she hangs around her neck. Adult toys where they, hey, you haven't called me all day. You didn't call me yesterday. Call me, call me, make me feel important. But how often did you get letters uh, from home when you were in Germany? Once a month, maybe. Three cents stamp, three cents stamp. Mm -hmm. Three cents stamp, how far would you get when they, would they move the letter for three cents now? Back to your post office box. <laughs> you wouldn't even leave them the post office. Right. They wouldn't even give it back to you. 
I guess they can't, they can't trash it, but they turn it through it in the trash. Anyway, things have changed, you know. Teletype's all gone, and, and teletype's all gone. But there's still a signal cord, right? Signal cord is still here. Okay. And and you're here for this um, Atomic Veterans event. What are you hoping will happen at this event? I, I've never, the only time that I've been to anything to do with it is, except for last week when we came, came here. And oh. she, we were at a, what, McDonald's? And she seen the pamphlet. He was stationed many places he hasn't told you. And he's never met up with anybody. He has one, contact Sign with one person. Signal Corps, Signal Corps people. You never see them. All the people, well, hey, at 87 years old, everybody's dead. <laughs> the same age. Just, just about. <laughs> so he's hoping that maybe uh, somebody that served when he served and in he was in so many different places, may, maybe they'd recognize the name Lyons. We put the last name first because that's what they call people. They are only known by their last name, not by their first. And then we make these little business cards to pass out in hopes that maybe somebody will have a business card and they'll have a friend because everyone has two or three friends that were in the military way back when. And maybe somebody will get the card and make contact with him. The seven-year-old grandson, he come to me the other day about two weeks, two, two weeks ago now. He says, he says, Grandpa, he says, what would you think about giving, giving me some money for my school, for my school, so we can have another field trip? I said, hey, if they're going to use it for staying in the classroom and studying, I might do it, not for a field trip. I said, you know what field trip that I got when I was going to school? I got mine in the summertime working out in the field. I, worked, I lived in North Dakota. It's a real field trip. <laughs> a real field trip. And you know what we did in the summertime? I worked out in the harvest field, either planting crops or harvesting the crops. And you go there at 8 in the morning and you stop at 5 or 6 o'clock at night. And stuff comes out, comes out of your forehead, out of your arms under your arms and everywhere else, all day long. He's drinking water and drinking water and drinking water and drinking water. And, it's a, and you get anywhere from 25 to 50 cents an hour. And you want me to give you money to mount a field trip? Stay in, stay in class and learn something. Most of the time they don't even know. They sit there and giggle and laugh and pick at each other on a field trip, and they come back, they don't know anymore than what they started with. Okay. Well, let's uh, hold this sign just, in front of the... I work, I work on C-O-M-M-O-N-S-E-N-S-E, -S -S -E, common sense. It's a good thing to work on. And if you don't have common sense, you should stay in bed with sideboards on it. Thank you very much, yeah. Wally. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Yeah, Back then, they didn't have any choice, you know. <laughs> now, bad. now the men, boy, they have to hand it to those that are volunteering now. My name is Barbara Lyons. Wally and I have been married for a little over 22 years. I got the best end of his service because when we got married. One of the guests at our wedding was a major, and he comes to me and he says, are you folks going to go on Space A? I says, are we going to do what? He says, are you going to go on Space A? I says, I don't even understand the words you're saying. 
He says, well, did you know that Wally, because he's retired military, gets to go any place in the world that the military goes as long as there's not a war going at that place? I says, um, what? And he says, and it's free. I says, free? Well, we ended up being, uh, for the first three years of our marriage, we were one of the most traveled couples in the world. We traveled all the time. There were three or four of us, five, five couples that we'd meet up in different locations. And we have been all over the world north of the equator. We had a motor home in Europe for four years. And when we were doing the Space A, it was much different than it is now. It was before 9-11. After 9-11, all the rules changed. But when we were doing it, we slept on the floors in the terminals. We had our little sack. It had a blow-up pillow. It had a blow-up mattress. It had a sheet, toothpaste, toothbrush, and comb. And we would lay down on two or three seats or on the floor at about 10 or 11 whenever the, they closed the, ter quote, closed the terminal. And then at five in the morning, we hear ding, 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 ding. And it's time to get up. We scramble real fast because we don't want to show any mess. And so we had a wonderful time. But the people that were married to the men when they were serving, that's really a tough, tough life. And I have to really acknowledge and thank all of the women that are serving as the wives and as the in the military now and the men in the military. It's very, very tough. And our country owes them a lot. They really do. So I appreciate you doing this. Uh, perhaps somebody will learn something. Perhaps somebody will get an idea to serve. And who knows? We have the greatest country in the world. Why everybody doesn't realize that, I cannot figure out. Because we used to be so free and so happy, and now things are so tough. I gotta admit that the, the troops that were in the trenches, probably one in five, maybe one in seven, had a dosimeter on, and that was it. Um, is your husband, is he, is he, okay. I'd like him to come up and speak for... Well, he was there for the teletype to tell the world. He was there when it went off. So I don't know if you want to, whatever. What? He does, they're talking about Camp Dexter Rock. Yeah. Dexter, is that the right name? Yeah, that is right. But he was in, uh, uh, he was in uh, 1952. He was in the Army, and he was on maneuvers, and they moved his maneuvers from Texas up to... Camp, Camp Desert Rock, yeah. The February 1952. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll. Communication. Well, well, well. <laughs> uh, he's having a tough time getting up. All right. He'll, he'll make it here in a minute. I just want to try to make sure that I get everybody to talk a little bit because this is the only way that we're going to get to know what everybody did and how complicated it was, and probably in some cases it wasn't the safest thing to do. <clears throat> Come on in. Wally Lyons, in the U.S. Army, not to do with the Navy, but anyway, we were on maneuvers in Texas for some several months, and we were designated by somebody through my commander to provide communications for the blast over here in 1952. And here's my tag here and says, and we, my, I was in the organization portion of the organization, it was a radio teletype, and the two and a half ton turn trucks and we set up camp over here, just east 
of Highway 95 mm -hmm. out of Las Vegas, a little ways, about maybe 30 miles. And we set up there an AP and UP and INS, the news services for the, for the newspapers, mm -hmm. all the newspapers. They were instructed to come there and write up their little, little ditties and hand them to our teletype operators. Mm -hmm. And they sit there on the, on the keyboards and they, and they came out with AP and UP and INS in Las Vegas at the newspaper offices. And from there, it went to Berlin, it went to the Philippines, it went to Moscow, and it went all over the world. And if you read the newspapers that day, you would have read about it, and it all comes through what we put out with the, with the keyboard out on Highway 95. But we were detailed to provide their communications. And that was what we did. We were detailed to come and provide that. And we were just there for the, for the blast. I stood there and watched from 10, I, I assume, I think they said it was 10 miles from ground zero, mm -hmm. west of Net McNellis, or the, or the ground zero. And I saw the B-52 come over. <laughs> then pretty quick, I saw the blast. Then comes the concussion. It's all over, and next thing you know, I've got a couple of boxes of all the all the reports, everything that everybody said going to the newspapers all over the world. That was the end of the story, and then we packed up our goods and went on to Camp San Luis Obispo, California, and finished the rest of our maneuvers. That was the end of the story. That's all that I was in. Ten miles from ground zero, probably straight west. Mm -hmm. I just didn't watch it. It went up. I had nothing to do with the operations of it at all, except for providing communications for the world. That was it. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to add to his comments because uh, when you have an atmospheric shot, uh, the, the fireball from the time it's fired, the, the oxygen comes rushing in at the bottom and then you get the stem and then the fireball goes up. But I will tell you, the fireball will be at uh, 4,000 feet in a minute and 10 seconds. And, and of course, naturally, it goes on up to around 11,000 and maybe some many hours. Uh, yeah, depends on the size.